Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 116. Coming up, creating images with emotion with professional photographer Mark Smith. But can you do us a favor first? Go to our website and check out some of the freebies that we give away. It's understandphotography.com. And right on the front page, it says, click here for freebies. We have, uh, what camera should I buy? Right now it's Christmas time and a lot of people are trying to get a new com camera. What camera should I buy is on there. That's a video. Uh, what you need to become a solid photographer. So it's kind of like a plan of action. We've got another handout that's travel photography essentials. And of course, right now we have 30 unique and practical gifts for photographers. So that's a really good one for this time of year. Um, we have some trips. We still have a few openings for some of our trips. Most of our trips are sold out for 2019, but check out our website. Check out the trips while you're there. And join us at the Florida Camera Club Council Conference, March 8th through the 10th, 2019. Both Joe Fitzpatrick and I are going to be speaking at that conference, and that's in Fort Myers, Florida in March. The website is f3c.org, and all that information is going to be in the show notes on our website at understandphotography.com. So my guest today is Florida-based nature photographer Mark Smith, and Mark conducts workshops in Florida, of course, Colorado also, and he just returned from a scouting trip in Costa Rica, so stay tuned for a trip there. He's written several books about bird photography, and he's got an amazing YouTube channel. You need to check it out. It's youtube.com slash C slash Mark Smith, but we'll also have that in our show notes. So welcome, Mark. Thank you for having me. Thank you for driving over. Oh yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so give us the, the version, the short, the short version of your, your life history as it pertains to photography. <laughs> oh boy, the short history. The short one, the short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I started taking uh, photographs as a kid. Um, I blame my father, or I should say, he encouraged me. Uh, my parents divorced when I was very young, so my father was kind of responsible for taking my brother and I out into nature and instilling the love for nature and the respect that I now have. So when he did this, we would go off on these adventures for weekends at a time, um, and he would give me his old camera, which was a Minolta. Uh, I'd probably get the model wrong, but I still have it. Um, he would load me up with film and basically go shoot to your heart's content. Um, I did, I had no idea what I was doing. I knew how to zoom, I knew how to click the shutter, that was about it. Um, and I think I about put him in the poorhouse going through all of the film and having him buy and develop, <laughs> buy and develop, buy and develop. As I got older, kind of lost interest, you know, became a teenager, decided to chase girls and music. So I did that for a little while and then my family and I, my wife and two children, about eight years ago, decided to travel across the country in an RV. We sold everything we owned, got in an RV and did it, and that's when photography really kind of took my soul, and, and it's been like that ever since. So. Oh, wow. I, oh, yeah. I lo you know, I homeschooled my son. Oh, so nice. Yeah. A lot of families are now, nobody was doing it back when I was homeschooling. Right. But now you hear about all these families going on, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. taking their kids homeschooling around the country. Sure. I, I I'm think jealous. That's I'm like, I wish they would have done that back in my day. I would have jumped on that. Sure. Although it, you couldn't really make a living back then because we didn't have... Oh, you know, the internet. Make an internet yeah, living yeah. now, they didn't really have such a thing. Sure, sure. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> hey, There's a great way to teach your kids, you know, on the road uh, with experience. You, you don't get that in a classroom, so that's yeah. so cool. And did fantastic. you make your living as a photo, like a travel photographer? Is that uh, what you did? Um, I, I'm also an author, so I had several books that kind of propelled me and and kept me doing and that. These are the books on bird photography. No, these are books on something else. Um, other subjects. I, Is it secret or? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> it's it's funny. I, I started again for my kids. I started doing some children's books, okay. and they were mildly successful, kind of in the vein of Dr. Seuss. I, I wrote and illustrated oh. them, um, and I learned that children's books have a very short lifespan because there's so many coming out, you know, so it, it's, they kind of go very quickly. Oh, yeah. um, so my other hobby at the time was uh, treasure hunting or metal detecting on the beach. So I wrote a book on that. That was successful. I expanded and wrote one to include the entire uh, hobby, I guess, of metal detecting and it quickly became a bestseller and still is to this day. Um, and that gave me the freedom to fully pursue 
photography. So wow, that that was so cool. yeah, it was really a, a cool a cool way to go about doing it. So wow, that's, very fortunate. Yeah, that is so <laughs> cool. And now, how long have you been seriously into photography? Oh, about about eight years. Yeah, so and then probably I'd say making a living off of it for three or four. And how do you make a living? Ooh, that's tough. <laughs> Workshops. Workshops, um, books. Um, that's mostly what I do. Yeah, like the idea of selling stuff. Like I've sold to magazines, but I think I do better with like uh, education and teaching people. Yeah, well, your YouTube um, channel is amazing. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I that's that's a lot of fun. And again, I, I owe that to my kids. Believe it or not, they my son convinced me to do that because I I told him you know I was going out getting these really great pictures of birds and kind of documenting the stories of animals that, that people don't get to see. And he said, you need to, you need to do this on YouTube. I said, ah, no, nobody's going to care about this. It's just me, you know, going out having fun. He's like, no, no, you need to. So I did. And, uh, kind of the writing that I do kind of helped fit into that. And, you know, over time, I think I've been doing YouTube for a little over a year. I've kind of been able to really shape it and pinpoint it with all of the people that, that follow, you know, they give me a lot of good suggestions and okay. kind of really nail it down to my voice and people respond very well to it. And again, all really because of my son pushing me to do that. So. You know, it's funny you say that because I think that all the time and I think a lot of us do that we think, well, nobody's going to care about this yeah. or that or the other thing, but people are really interested. We had a guy from Miami here, um, Eden Chavez. He was a really good guest. But <clears throat> he took like video of himself driving over and then he <laughs> and Joe went out and shot the sunset and he's like taking video of it. And it, I guess it's part, partially my generation. It seems so vain to be like, look at me, look at me, look <laughs> right? at me. But I loved watching his videos. Sure. So people do, people are interested. In yeah. Them. And I think people in general too, you, you kind of fall into a bubble that, that is your own. So like, like for instance, but going from here to Colorado, you know, I, I can share pictures of brown pelicans, something we have here. You see every day, hundreds of them. But there are people that will go their entire life with never seeing a brown pelican. So it's like you kind of form this bubble of everything that you're used to, and, and it, it just becomes kind of nonchalant. But to other people, it's amazing, you know, yeah. because they never get to see or experience these things. So it kind of taught me to think globally. You know, because what we have in Florida is very special. You don't, I don't think you have it anywhere else on the planet. I agree. And, uh, You're so lucky. Yeah, yeah people, people really, like I said, they, they like it. They respond to it very well. So. Are you from Florida? Oh, yeah. I'm the rare born and raised wow. native Floridian. Yeah, I was born in Winter Park. Winter Park. Yeah, many years ago. <laughs> Winter Park has changed a lot. <laughs> yes, it has. Yeah, yeah. My wife, too, she was born in Winter Park. Which oh, is, wow. Yeah. Two native Floridians. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about, we're going to talk about a little bit about creativity and mm -hmm. moods. And so, so let's start with like, what, what can the right mood do to an image? I mean, how do you, you, t you, you talk a lot about this on your, on your website. It's really, that's like a, I don't know, it's open-ended mm -hmm. question. Is that the right answer? Um, the mood can do really anything. I mean, you, you can inspire people. You can make them laugh. You can make them cry. Uh, you can make them feel uh, anger. I mean, there's, you, it's, it's all there. It's, it's just a matter of how, how you want to portray the story. Okay. And, you know, I don't think, uh, again, we kind of glaze over all the imagery in our life. There's, there's images that are thrown at us everywhere, and they, they do something. You know, they, they, sometimes they're designed to make you purchase something. You know, sometimes they're desire, designed to make you feel a certain way. You know, so... It, it's all a matter of trying to capture that. And for like what I like to do, I like to kind of invoke the emotion, if, if it's such a thing, you know, a lot of people are kind of disconnected from nature, but the emotion that's involved with like a creature's life and, and kind of what they're going through, try to, try to make it more human. Does that make sense? So I, I don't know if that's kind of what you're looking for. So or? you're talking about like in wildlife, you want to try to like put yourself in the bird's Oh yeah, definitely. Shoes, like or whatever the creature might be. So yeah. you can feel the, 
sure. excitement or the fear or whatever. Yeah. And, and how, how do you do that in a, a photograph? There's the hard question. Yeah. <laughs> I just gave you an easy one first. <laughs> this one's hard. <laughs> um, I think you really have to capture that special moment that conveys a story or a message to a person. They have to feel connected to it um, on several ways. They, they have to feel connected to it personally, um, maybe connected to the animal and whatever is happening in the story with the animal, be it happy, sad, fear. I mean, you have to be able to connect them. Um, for me, I've found that it's easier for me because of my writing ability to kind of fill in the gaps. So you can kind of think of the stuff I do as an illustrated story, and then the images help illustrate all of those points. Um, but it all happens there in real time. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, they're telling the story. I'm just trying to bring it in a way to the people so that they understand it because they don't get to tell their story. So um, what kind of, like what elements of an image would bring life, out life. emotion? Uh, like it, action? Like yeah, well, action it, shots, it, well it really depends on, on the story you're trying to tell. Okay. Um, like for instance, I, I followed a family of sandhill cranes for three months. I wanted to oh. document the birth of a chick and the struggles that this chick went through through its entire three-month span you know, of, of growing up. Um, so I was presented with many different uh, emotions throughout this period. I mean, some, some I knew. You, know, you, you kind of know, know the lay of the land on what the, the enemies might be, you know, the bad guys in the story, okay. like alligators or other birds. The bad guys. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. So you kind of know these things as you're going in and as you spend time with them. Um, but in the end of this one, uh, people ended up being the bad guys. And I, I never anticipated that at all, you know. And that, and that was, it kind of taught me a lesson. But the time with them, uh, you know, it really depends on that mood that you're trying to convey. I, I got, you know, saw it all and experienced it all. I saw, if you, if you can believe it, you know, I saw love between a mother and, and the chick from, from the way she was nurturing and caring for the baby. Um, for instance, there was a sunset, it was cold, or a sunrise, and it was cold. The sun was coming across the, the mother's back, and the baby just kind of snuggled down in the back and, and was under the safety and the warmth of mom. And mom turned around, and they, they touched beaks, and the moment they touched beaks, I got that shot. And that, that was that bond, you know, that was that moment of human emotion you know yeah. to, to me even though they're animals they they feel and see things on a level I think that we don't always comprehend uh, because we're not built to see and perceive these things yeah so that's kind of a long-winded answer but no, it was I, good I mean you can you can capture all of these moments in in the story that you're trying to tell the emotion of this mother and I say it's her mother the mother only because of this one had more of a mothering quality. The other one was always standing guard and, and fighting, keeping everybody at bay. That was the dad. I, I, I think. I could, <laughs> I could be wrong. You know, the, the, the hierarchy of these animals could be different. But um, so capturing that moment, that was just one, you know, and I, I captured others where uh, both the parents attacked a 14-foot alligator because the alligator attacked the baby. This is a sandhill crane. Oh, they, they, they drove it into the water, pecking it on the head. Wow. And, and so I got, you know, that emotion of, of them protecting, you know, their, their offspring. And I also got them feeding it, you know, anything they could just so that it could outgrow the threat of predation. So they, they stuffed it with snakes, lizards, eggs, I mean, anything they could so that it would grow. So being able to experience that short time frame of three months, but in that time frame, see this chick grow from this to, to this and then fly away. And well, because this is also a podcast, we're talking from five inches. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Four feet. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to <laughs> three feet. How tall correct. Are they? They're pretty tall. They're, they're pretty tall, yeah. Um, so just being there and being within all those moments, you can capture all of those emotions, but it's really just, just timing. You know? It's a, a matter of being in the right place at so the right now, time. Okay, so how did you find this family? And then... Where was it, and then how, what well, did you go out, every day? or Every day, yeah, yeah. So where was it, how'd you find it? Um, it was in Vero Beach at a wastewater treatment plant. Um, somebody told me where they were, said that, you know, there's a, a family nesting. I found them on my wife and I's anniversary, um, which was... was is that what you took your wife for a date there? Yes, actually, <laughs> we, we did. <laughs> and we both watched them, you know, the, the two parents on the nest. They had two eggs. Uh, about a week later, it hatched on my birthday. 
which wow. was very, very special. So this was a special family. Oh, yeah, to you. very much so. Um, only one chick hatched. The other egg never hatched. Oh, yeah, okay. so um, it was in, yeah, did I say where? It was at West Vero Wastewater Treatment Plant, okay. which is a water treatment plant in Vero Beach. Um, fantastic place. I've heard of it. Yeah, they, it's a good birding place. Right? Yeah, it's very yeah. good. They, uh, the sandhill cranes come there and nest every year. Uh, so. We don't get sandhill cranes this far south. Oh man, they're fantastic. I know, they're fantastic. beautiful. I get yeah. so jealous because they're all, just in Fort Myers they have them, but here we, they yeah. just, it's just too far south. Well, I, I had, you know, uh, a really strange moment with them I, because I spent every day with them. They kind of accepted me and, and, and I was no longer I guess a threat. I, I was almost part of the family. So I could, I, it, sometimes I would be filming them and taking pictures and they would get within the minimal focal distance of my lens and I couldn't get focus. And I, I'd kind of snap out of the camera like, oh, you guys are right here. You know, wow, wow. You're, you're really close. Now, how close were you? Um, they, they came within two or three feet at and, times. And so what kind of lenses were you using? Um, I was using a 200 to 500 at the time. Okay. So I could back off and, mm -hmm. and get close when I wanted to. Um, and I was shooting, alternating between shooting video and stills at the, the same, same time. Camera? With the same camera? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was able to capture. So you were to on capture, a tripod then? Uh, most of it was on hand. Um, I Even doing the video with a long lens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I try my best. It doesn't always work. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> The, the VR on this lens is very good. So and what do you shoot with? Nikon, Nikon. yeah. And it's the, the Nikon 200 to 500. It's kind of legendary in the Nikon world. It's probably their best wildlife lens for the money. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I shot all of it on that. Um, I had actually two instances that were really quite special with these birds. Uh, one morning, I, if I was with the mom and the baby, and I had gotten down really low to the ground to, to get a nice perspective to make them look larger than life because they are so big. Um, and the father flew in and he was acting all crazy. I mean, not like he had ever done to me before. He was flapping his wings and he was kind of honking and making all this noise. I was like, whoa, whoa, okay, I'm, I'm too close. Uh -huh. And so I, I started to get up and when I started to get up, I looked behind me and the alligator was coming up on the bank behind me. Uh -huh. And the, the crane was actually coming to me saying, hey, hey, there's... He the, was warning you. Yeah, he was warning me, right? It's cool. So I did what he did. I stood up and went, ah, I made all kinds of noise and, you know, threw my arms scared around and off. scared him off, yeah. Um, over the course of the time I spent with them, it, at the end, uh, we were getting into May, so we are getting into like our summer showers every day. So I would get run off every afternoon because of the storms. I wouldn't want to be there with the lightning hitting and all that stuff. And I think the next to the last day, a bad storm rolled in and I left. And I, I remember I went home and I said to my wife, I said, I feel bad about leaving them. It just doesn't feel right. So I showed up the next morning and I couldn't find them. And this was the first time ever that I could never find them, right? So this was really bizarre. Uh, I saw out of the corner of my eye two cranes come and land right next to me and they were making this noise that was really different. You know, they have a bugle that's, that's really easy to pinpoint, but this was like a, a real quiet, real low gurgle. And okay. I was like, oh, this is very strange. And I noticed it was the father and the chick, but the mother wasn't there. Uh -oh. And it, it came up to me and it was just kind of looking at me, making this slow gurgle. And I was like, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, of course, I don't speak the language. Yeah. <laughs> so another storm rolled in and I left and I went home and I, I went to my wife and son and I said, something's wrong. There, there's something wrong. I grabbed my son. I said, you got to come back with me. So he came back with me and we got to the spot. He was there waiting in the parking lot. So this like, is after the storm? After the storm. Same day. Same day. Okay. He was there in the parking lot waiting for me. And he's making this little gurgling noise. And out of nowhere, I had this idea. And I looked at my son. I said, oh my God, she's been hit by a car. And she's in a ditch on the side of the road. And he said, how do you know this? I said, I don't know. And I don't want to go look. So the, the male then leads out. And he's kind of making this gurgling noise. And he leads me out. And sure enough, she's in the ditch on the side of the road. She'd been oh, hit by a car. Was she dead? No. Um, but she was badly wounded. And so I called. Because they're protected. You're not allowed to, to, to handle them. So I called all of these places. And nobody would come out. So I finally got a hold of an animal control officer. And he said, I'll come out but I can't go into the canal where she is. It's, it's forbidden, you know, but I'll tell you what you can do if you want to go get her. And I said, oh, no, yeah, no question, I'll go get her. So I went down and got her. We pulled her out, took her back into the wetlands and set her down. And she kind of just crumbled into a ball. Oh. So I took her to a rehab about an hour away. And two days later, they called me and they had to euthanize her because oh. she was so badly damaged. Um, the next day I went back, I got to see the father and the chick fly out for the season and not come back. So it was, 
That's what I was saying. Wow. I never that expected. Is emotional. Yeah. Now I'm gonna cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, the, the videos on YouTube and um, it's been used a lot in the classroom. Uh, people are uh, teachers are teaching their kids, uh, and it's having a really profound uh, response. It, it was so profound that. I had several people email me and say, you need to talk to the local officials in the county and they need to do something about it. So I emailed them and within 30 minutes got a response and they said, hey, we want to we want to help as much as we can. We'd like to put maybe signs on the road outside of the, the wetlands. Where would you like them? And they sent me an aerial map. Oh, so and you became in charge. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, OK, one here and one here. And two days later, the signs were up. So oh. even though this bird died, you know, she can live on in the story yeah. of her. And we have these signs up now that kind of... And you got this great video on YouTube about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, right well it's, right it's, after. it's sad, so, you know, it's a tearjerker. But, again, I, I said I, I kind of knew who the... What I thought was the bad guy, but I, I never expected it to be a human that would, yeah. would kind of foil the whole story. Oh. And so there's there's a good way to run yeah yeah there's a good way to I mean it's not like you wouldn't notice hitting a bird that size you you would notice yeah for yeah, sure what a jerk yeah jeez <laughs> yeah wow so there's some a good way to express emotion but you know in, in what your you photography just, well you just brought a whole but you took a, a you made a whole story yes which was yeah. uh, actually that's a whole different subject but it's a fascinating subject I'm like this is a great idea because I just I guess I don't get out enough you yeah know? yeah. I'm working all million hours a week, and I'm like, I gotta get out and take some pictures. But you made a concentrated effort to go out every day. Yeah. And you went in the afternoon. I went in the morning. You went in the morning. Yeah, every morning. Okay. Yeah, but at, you said the afternoon sunrise. showers. Well, they come in around noon, around lunchtime. They do. Yeah, over there they do. They do. That's interesting. Oh yeah. Later here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. that far away. That's why I was surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah in fact, that place closes around three. They, they, they'll come <laughs> boot you out of there. So yeah. you went out every morning? Yes. And just photographed? Photographed and, and filmed. Videoed. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that was quite the undertaking to kind of take three months and put it down into 30 minutes. So wow. Is it 30 minutes is what yeah. it is? That's wow. the longest video I have. Yeah, yeah but that sounds Most like of them I try to keep around 10. Yeah, I know. I, I watched <laughs> some of them. They're really, really good. You're, oh, you thank are you. a really good storyteller, which thank maybe you. that's, we might talk about that too because. Um, we're supposed to be talking about emotion and moods, <laughs> right, Heather? <laughs> I kind of went off on a tangent there. No, but, but that I was mean, good. No, it was really good. Yeah. I'm fascinated. So that was an emotional story. Yes. And you captured a lot just by being there at the right time in the right place. But let's talk about somebody like me who only goes out not nearly as much as I would like to. Sure, sure. So what can I do? Or what, can you take a picture and say... What can I do to this picture to, to make it more emotional? I mean, does color, would color make a difference or? Uh, you know, uh, I, I think it depends on, on the viewer. You okay. know, I, I think it's really, you know, photography as an art form is so subjective. It, it's, it can be hard to, to know how it makes another person feel, especially colors. Um, for me, it, it's always a life moment. That, that really has the most emotion because people can connect okay. to that life moment, you know, whatever that life moment is. So um, if I was to tell somebody or if somebody to ask me, you know, how to get more emotion in my photos, it's to be in, in there and catch those moments of life, you know, like, like if you're doing <coughs> portrait work or, or you're, photo, you know, uh, taking pictures of a family, um, every parent wants their child's first steps, you know, you, you want yeah. those life moments. Um, yeah kind of the same lines you know. yeah yeah you can always yeah and you know you mentioned color it I don't have like a natural eye for color so to speak um, I know a lot of people do they have they know color harmonies and, and I, that's something I have to actually really push to understand uh -huh. it's just how my brain works it's a little different in that sense like my daughter for instance she has a really good sense of color harmony she knows what colors go well together I don't so <laughs> you shoot it like it is do you? I mean, you're not yeah. a big Photoshop guy, right? No, I, I do shoot raw, you know, and I try to capture the best exposure in camera as possible. Um, but raw gives you a little leeway, you know, for... But you don't doctor it up to make it all crazy or anything? Oh, no, not at all. No, no, not at all, no. Um, I it, think looks nice. it looks yeah, like it looks. Yeah, yeah. Only better. Sure, sure. <laughs> De depending on what you're taking photos of, you know, uh, sunsets and sunrises can be a little difficult, so... In that sense. 
Now, do you use filters at all? Like, well, you probably use a, a circular polarizer lens if you're taking stuff in the middle of the day, right? Uh, no. not for the birds, no. no. Um, only because of the, the big lens I use. Oh, they don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't even reach it. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And some of them, you know, they have a drop-in filter you put in the back. And they have polarizers that you can use. But I'm always moving so quickly that I've found the polarizers are best when the sun is 90 degrees to your left or right. That's when they have the biggest effect. And you put the sun behind you. Correct. And so I'm does that it, from Artie Morris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's, there's, there's a little bit better way. I went with a, a guy who's been doing photography for, for years. I mean, an older guy. And he noticed that I was always putting the sun directly behind me, uh -huh. but that's wrong. You actually want to put the sun directly behind you and then just angle two or three degrees to the right. And then you create shadows on white birds that you wouldn't have created otherwise. Like just enough to see texture in the feathers. And that was a really good tip he gave me. And I started doing that a lot. It's funny and it you makes say a, that because, makes a big difference. you know, my training, even though now for what, since 2009, I've been learning about nature photography. So I'm, I do more nature photography than but for fun, but I'm still making a living in portrait sure. photography. And when I had all these bird photographers, you know, taking classes and people are like, Son, and I thought the same thing. I'm like, don't you need a little shadowing to give it, bit. you know, yeah. a little texture. And <laughs> exactly, yeah. So that's what we do in portraiture, except when you're an older woman, you want flat, <laughs> flat lighting, yes. get rid of the wrinkles. Yes, we yes. don't want texture. <laughs> <laughs> No texture, please. <laughs> so do you feel like, I don't know, like your depth of field or the length of your lens makes a big difference when you're, when, especially with oh, wildlife? Oh, most definitely. Um, I mean. Depth of field is a huge uh, play on, on what you're doing because you really want to isolate your subject from that background. So not only depth of field, but distance between your subject and the background is a huge bonus too. So, so if you can have them as separated as possible. Yes, yes, yes. So I've noticed that like for birds, if, or even like elk, if you're chasing you know, bigger creatures out west, if the background is further away, you know, the boca is so much smoother. I always pronounce that wrong too, so I might be wrong on that word. Um, but the blurred background is always nicer and it really isolates your subject really well. Yeah. So, you know, shooting with that shallow depth of field helps with that as well. I agree with but that. But distances okay. make a, up a big part of that equation. Yeah, well, because if, if they're right on top of the background it's, it's not going to do anything gonna do any good yeah. what about like land like big landscapes can you can you get emotion into a landscape oh yeah most most certainly yeah um i find landscapes to be really challenging though because me and you can be in the same place looking at the same exact thing and 50 other people are right there looking at the same exact thing so how do you uh, put your spin on it or how do you add emotion to it so for me, with, with landscapes, it's really a, a slowing down and trying to make a Bob Ross painting, if that makes sense to you. So there'd be layers, layer after layer after layer after layer, as deep as possible, so you draw that person in and they just, they kind of get lost. That's the actual composition part. Okay, what do you mean by layers? Layers, layers. Oh, you have to watch Bob. You have to watch him paint his canvas. <laughs> um, so you have a lot in the foreground. Yeah. Maybe something in the middle, okay. something in the back, uh -huh. and then you have the sky. Okay. But then little things in between all of that. Oh, something okay. interesting the whole layers. way back. Yeah, so it's deep, you know, a lot of, a lot of three dimension, you know, so. If you can, are you shooting all that very sharp, so like? Yes, yeah, well, it also depends on how you want to shoot it. There's, yeah. there's different ways, different technology. Um, like you can focus stack. So, you so can, that everything is sharp? Yeah, but that, you know, I, I've done that and it looks unnatural because... I've never done that. It's, it's cool. And you can do it in Photoshop now, right? Doesn't yeah, Photoshop yeah. Photoshop have that option? Sure. Not as good as the other plug-in software. Ah, Photoshop does quite well. Does um, it? Yeah, the, the Nikon body that I use, I use a, a D850. Uh -huh. It has focus shift built in. So okay. you set your front plane of focus and then you say, I want to shoot 30 pictures to infinity and it will shift the plane of focus for you. you so you just press really? a button and walk that away. Really? That is so cool. Yeah, and then you can stack them in Photoshop. Okay. But like I said, when you do that, it, it's cool because you can zoom in, you get a nice image, but it looks unnatural because that's not how we see. Okay. You see a little bit of haze off in the distance. Right. You see a little bit of blurriness. So. Yeah. Um, it, again, it depends on how you want to shoot. But back to like the emotion in the landscape, uh, I found that you know you got to have clouds, you got to have the right light. Totally, you got to have the right light. Storms, they, they invoke all kinds of emotions. So if you, if you can get that composition 
and come back when the sky is not clear and blue and say there's a storm happening on that same composition that you now have in your mind and then, and then the sun is setting in that storm casting all kinds of crazy light then you have that emotion that's in the shot at least for me that's that's how i like to look at it so i'll scout out an area and i'll say this place is perfect but the lighting's not good or it's just flat there's nothing happening it's just it's a beautiful landscape but it doesn't make a great photograph so then i'll wait till that moment comes about and um, i had that happen i there was a little building in colorado that i drove by for months so this little building is perfect this little building is perfect drove by no 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 then one day i was out with my son as as the sun was setting and this nasty storm came in and the storm was crazy it it came in and the storms in colorado are very different um there were these big holes in the storm to where you could see blue sky through these black clouds and i happened to be at this location as these nasty black clouds were covering up these big patches of blue and the sun was setting right behind the porch of this little teeny old pioneer house like made from the 1800s it through the starburst i got the shot and i was like oh that sounds so cool it was fantastic <laughs> and it was one of those shots that as soon as you put it up everyone says you faked that That's, that doesn't happen in reality oh, i was like yeah. i was there yeah this 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 happened so again that was like one of those times when i i had the 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 place set up but it, the timing and the emotion or the moment wasn't right. So you got to really. So you had already, you knew this little oh, yeah. shack, or what, I, was it a shack? Is that what you called it? A uh, cottage? Yeah, a little, it was it? like an old pioneer house, house. Like from the 1800s, okay. yeah. So you knew about the house. Oh, yeah. And you go there and you're like, I like this location, but I need clouds, or I need. I need, I need something. I need to come back yeah. at sunset. I need to come back at sunrise. I need to. Correct. Yeah. Okay, that's really good advice, though, if you think about that, because. You know, we do tours in the Everglades. That's sure. one, a big part of our business. And uh, <laughs> I had these ladies last week hired me for the full day. They just the main their main goal was just they wanted new spots. Mm -hmm. But like half the spots I took them to, which are usually fabulous, were just horrible oh, that day. You know, yeah, yeah. Was, even though I think they they still appreciate it because I took them to a lot of new spots. But a lot of them were just. You know, sometimes I'm there and it's beautiful, but that day just everything was there was no there were no no clouds in the sky, yeah. and it was the middle of the day because they wanted to go all the way through sunset. So we started at ten, I think. Uh, so we had sort of harsh harsh light lighting all day. All day. Yeah. I did what I did, which saved my the day, is I brought my infrared camera and I brought discs or memory cards for them so they both used my infrared because oh, cool. it was good for infrared sure but it was still would have been better with clouds yeah but that's the thing you guys who come to visit us come in the <laughs> summer because <laughs> it's amazing big, being billowing beautiful clouds. in the yeah. summer here yeah but everybody comes in the winter and yeah no clouds <laughs> yeah true 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 when is the storm season in colorado ah uh, Colorado season or? Colorado is funny the locals will tell you mother nature is drunk because it will rain one day and then 10 minutes later it will snow and then 10 minutes later you're out in shorts and a t-shirt and you're fine so there's it's right on an edge you know you get all the west coast storms coming in they hit the mountain range weird things happen so you never really know what's going to happen in Colorado at any time of day or time of year it's quite dramatic well I think that's where Part, do you go in Colorado? We go to the, to the western side in a little town called Montrose. Okay. The locals would call it Montrose. So that's how, you, yeah, that's how you can tell the difference. The tourists are Montrose. The locals say Montrose. Montrose. Um, that's the, the big town that is close to everybody that's familiar with is Telluride. So okay. it's about an hour and a half, only 30 miles, but an hour and a half to Telluride because you have to do crazy. Oh, of the mountains. Yeah, switchbacks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful place, beautiful, beautiful place. And that's where you do your photo tours? Um, that's where I'm doing one set this summer. Yeah, I, I, there's, I know an area where there's, it's kind of a really fragile area where uh, hummingbirds come in for just a few weeks oh, as wow. part of their migration. And uh, a lot of people wanted to come out and do that because I made a video highlighting the story of these hummingbirds and uh, people fell in love with it. So. You got a real thing going <laughs> there with those stories. Yeah. I mean, you're... It's, 
Usually if I see a video that's 10 minutes long on YouTube, I'm like, oh, I don't want to watch 10 minutes. But I got sucked into yours about the fish, and I was like, oh. this is so interesting. And I didn't even know I was interested in fish. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the fall uh, mullet migration, I think, probably. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. It was really a... It's fascinating. It was so well put together, too, the video Oh, thank was. you. Thank and you. How, how long did it take you to put... Or How many times did you go out? Once. One time. That was, that was one, af really one afternoon and one morning of shooting. And that takes me about an uh, a day to put it all together and tell the story. That's really, really impressive. I'll tell oh, you thanks. about that. So I get lucky a lot when I go out. Now, do you... <laughs> okay, so I'm kind of switching gears because yeah. what... Because uh, your storytelling is really fascinating to me because you're so good at it. Mm. Do you... Like, okay, so the, somebody told you about the Sandhill Crane, so you just said, I'm going to document their lives. Yeah, it was that simple. It just came to you. Yep, yep. What about the fish? Um, same. I, I saw it. I was familiar with it because I had experienced it plenty of times myself. And I, you know, kind of what I talked about before that that bubble that you get into and, and thinking on a, a worldly basis. I said people around the world need to see this. This is absolutely amazing, and it is. It's it's fascinating on on every sense from from the fish that are there by the thousands to everything that shows up to feed on them. It's just, just this big feeding frenzy. And, and to actually see, you know, stand there and watch it is just amazing. Wow. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard for me not to be amazed. When I see this, I'm like, a lot of times, you know, if, if there were people filming me, you know, I'd be yelling, the whole, oh, wow, yeah, look at this. <laughs> oh, 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 you know, and chasing things down the beach out of breath. But that's part of it. I, it's, it's like I'm a little kid, you know. And, you know, another good thing about this that a lot of people don't consider is it's a good escape, really, from, like, maybe if you have a, you know, you're working hard and, and you just want to get away from things. Because when you're there and, and you become part of that world, you really do forget about everything for that moment that you're there. So it's, it's like a, another blessing, like kind of yes. hidden in there with it all. So what other stories have you come up with? And Oh, my goodness. That... Uh are you working on a story now? Yes, actually, it takes place uh, the same place where the sandhill cranes were. Okay. Um, there are, let me see if I get it right, six osprey that, okay. that show up every day. And I've already said this location is supposed to be secret. Shh. Hopefully Shh. nobody remembers. So there's six osprey that show up every day, um, along with about 50 wood storks, gray blue herons, egrets, tricolored herons, all of these different uh, birds show up in this one pond because there are so many fish. Um, and the fish, uh, for lack of a better term, are trapped they're, and they're hiding. It, it's, you'd have to wait and see the video. But these ospreys come in and they, they're like no other bird in the world. They, they hover above the water, you know, 50 to 100 feet. They see a fish that's maybe in two feet of water and they come flying out of the sky straight down like a lead balloon. They disappear in the water. They're underwater for a moment. And when you think about it, the moment they hit water, they're now part of the food chain because they're in the water with alligators. And alligators will take anything they can. So now this osprey has this dilemma. It's, it's fallen on, say, a three-pound tilapia, which is more than the osprey weighs. And the osprey has to somehow get out of the water with this gigantic fish before it becomes food. Okay. So, there's a struggle at the surface of the water as you see them trying to get out of the water with, this, with the fish. And most of the times they're successful. But when they get out of the water and they have the fish, is the microphone? Yeah, pull it out a little. Yeah. It's like stuck on your neck. Oh, Just that's, that's unfortunate. Shirt. Is it? Did I get it here? <laughs> Maybe like that. Is that good? Is that better? All right. Okay. When they get out of the water, if they don't abandon the fish already, there are a group of eagles that hide about a half a mile away. And the eagles here are nasty. They, they, they don't hunt for food on their own. So it's amazing to watch this osprey struggles. It goes in the water. It pulls out this huge fish. And it, the amount of energy that it is expelled just to go down and pull this fish out is, is astronomical. And then to see this eagle a half a mile away come tearing out of the tree and attack this osprey in midair and take its fish. It's heartbreaking for the osprey. Oh. <laughs> heartbreaking. And then you, see the, then you see the eagle fly away with the fish, and guess what the osprey's stuck doing? Fishing again and putting itself in this, wow. this precarious situation. 
and it, it happens quite often. Um, but it's 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 an amazing thing to watch. You know, uh, you, I feel bad for the osprey. A lot of people would feel bad for the fish. I mean, the, the fish are there too. Um, they're part of the food chain. The osprey's doing all of this work, and, and it's getting robbed right yeah. right in front of you. Yeah. It, it's not cool. But what did, I heard something. Somebody said eagles are just vultures with good public P with yeah. Good PR. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's very, very good. They, but vultures aren't that aggressive like no, that. No, <laughs> no. The, the eagles are, are bullies. And I yeah. saw the same thing when we, uh, I photographed them this summer in Washington. There's a place in Washington State where the tide goes out and exposes all these oysters. And the gray blue herons show up and they eat these fish called these plain fin midshipmen, this really weird deep sea fish that shows up there. And the eagles come and fight. And so you have these gray blue herons and eagles fighting and it's, it's fantastic for photography. Wow, and it's yeah. great to watch and, and photograph. But when you think about it, it's like, ah, these eagles, man. They're bullies. They're, They're mean. bullies. Yeah, yeah. That could be a whole story. Well, I did Eagles that one. And the, bu the bully eagle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, they, I, yeah, um, that's one story I'm working on. Uh, but your story, you're taking it from the Ospreys. Oh, yeah. They're, uh, they're the star of the they, show. They're the star. <laughs> oh, most, most definitely. They, don't, they don't get enough credit for what they do. Now, you do video, and you're telling the story on video, but you're also taking stills. Correct. So I combine two things that I really love, photography. So I kind of teach with what, all my settings. I'll overlay my settings and why I chose those settings for those shots. And then conservation with the birds and the animals and, okay. and how hard it is for them to do what they do. You know, we have it easy. We can go to the grocery store. We can buy food. We go to bed. We wake up the next morning. All of these animals, it's a daily fight for their lives. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty brutal out there. I don't even go to the grocery store. I get it <laughs> delivered now. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I would make it out there and roughing it. It was funny last year during the hurricane, you know, or after the hurricane, and we didn't have any power. And my friend who takes me out into the Everglades brought me a big cooler of ice because mm -hmm. he's got generator. He lives out in the Everglades. And he's like, this is preparing you for camping. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I do like to hike out in the Everglades, but I don't think I want to sleep out there. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you prefer more of what they call glamping, which is like glamorous I've never done camping? That yet. Yeah. Yeah. I probably could handle that. Yeah. Because <laughs> he goes out, he's tough. He's like, oh, we got to go camping in Flamingo. I'm like, isn't that where all the mosquitoes are? Oh, uh, you get he's eaten like, alive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Then why would I do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, what other? Tell me some more stories. Oh, How do uh, you come up with this? I mean, do they, they just come they to come, you? They come up with the stories. And now, the, all do you, the animals. Tell me about your life. Mm. Okay, so you get up and just say, I'm going to go take pictures today, and you just, something I, I get eventually up. hits you that's a story? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, typically, that's how it will work. I'll get up an hour before sunrise, and I'll go out with my camera, and I'll explore, and I'll find something that just feels good to me, story-wise. Uh -huh. And then if I don't get it all in one day, I'll go back and fill in the gaps and kind of put it all together that way. Um, there's another really cool place close by to where I live, um, and I have full plans on doing this documentation, and it's a rookery for spoonbills. Mm. And um, so over about three months, I'll be there to document the entire process. And there's a few underlying story elements that a lot of people aren't aware of. That okay, what do you mean by the entire process and what are the underlying stories? Oh, uh, from start to finish, them populating this island that they use for... To, you mean when you say populating, coming from wherever, where do they come from? I, they stay in Florida, at least in my understanding. Yeah, they're here all year. Yeah, yeah. but they're not in large groups. Okay. So they'll show up and they'll, they'll mate and they'll build their nest. They'll be at any given time, 150 to 200 of them, and they're mixed in with anhingas, tricolored herons, snowy egrets, cattle egrets, all the other little wading birds are in there with them as well. And they're on these two little islands, so the whole process of them building the nest, they, spoonbills carry some amazing things with them four or five times their size, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, mm -hmm. to build their nests, and so you, uh, being able to see that is, is quite a treat. What, what, where are, the, are their nests up in? Mangroves, or uh, I don't I don't know what the actual plant is that they use at this specific place. But they're up, they're, they're up raised. high. Yeah, they're, they're raised and they're on islands, and that was one of the underlying story elements. They're on islands for a reason. They the birds know that they're safe from predation on the islands. Okay. The alligators also know that when it's time for fledging, that the cost 
of them patrolling and keeping all of the predators at bay comes at the cost of a few young ones have to be fed off to the alligators. Oh, wow. So that's kind of this underlying. So as all of these birds start to fledge, the alligators start to show up in great numbers and they start to do some amazing things trying to grab these birds, these baby birds that don't know how to fly yet. Oh. Yeah, so, but like I said, it's kind of part of the price because they patrol all the time, the alligators, and that keeps the raccoons and the bobcats and all the other stuff out of oh, the nest. so that they can, their eggs can actually hatch. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And then if you're lucky, which I was last year, you can get there when all of them have fledged, and you're, you're talking like 100 to 150 baby birds that don't know how to fly yet, and they've, they've fledged maybe from this island 50 feet over to a road, it's a dirt road, and they wait in this road in the morning until it gets warm enough to give them enough lift to start learning how to fly. So you get to experience 150 to 50 of these baby birds. Oh my God! Just that attempting so flight. Cool. Oh, it's fantastic! It's it's amazing because they have no idea what they're doing. They'll, they'll get up and they'll go sideways and kind of land. They they look like they've had too much to drink. You know? oh. So it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know that that'll be a a pet project and that'll, that'll in, take in a long time. And the spring time. is in when the, the spring. birds. Yeah, for sure. Because almost all the birds have their babies in the spring, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely here. Um, it, it can change, like uh, the great blue herons over where we are are already starting, which is a little early this year. Wow, that, yeah, because yeah, what is, it, it's not even December. No, no, so they're, they're courting, they're mating, and they're building their nests, which is another really cool experience too. Um, so that, that would make a good story as well. So. Yeah, the whole mating rituals and yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. That's yeah, you can get the great blue herons sometimes when they, you know, you said this is a podcast, but sometimes they'll come up beak to beak, and when they do, the space in between their heads is a heart. Aww. And it, it's kind of like a loving thing that they're doing, and it's, it's just ironic that there's this heart. Aww. So the, the goal with that one would be to get them when they're doing that, with the sun maybe behind them Ugh. in that heart space, and then you have a really fantastic image. So wow. You have this life moment that really shows emotion, and then if you can put that golden light of the sun right in the middle, oof, you, oof. people would That's really, really connect to that. That's a good goal to, to go for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be tough, but it, it's doable. So. Wow, yeah, well, you'd have to do sunrise over there on your side, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, maybe sunset, depending on where you were. Okay. Yeah. There's, a, there's a couple places, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. That is fascinating. All right, so what else? What else you got going on? What do you have exciting coming up? Uh, well, I just got back from Costa Rica, so that will be Where'd probably the Osa Peninsula. Okay. Uh, the Osa Peninsula has been named by National Geographic as the most biodiverse and intense place on the planet wow. because of the small area and all of the wildlife that's there. And that's in the Gulf side? It's on the Pacific side okay. and the Gulf side, okay. but it's on the west side of Costa Rica. So there's its own Gulf that comes in from the Pacific. Yeah, oh. so, so it's on the west side of Costa okay. Rica. Yeah, um, and uh, the people in, that usually go to the Osa Peninsula never leave. And it doesn't take you long to figure out why. Um, if you've ever been to Costa Rica, this was my I've first experience. I've never been to that area. I've been to um, Costa Rica. Yeah, so their, their motto is Pura Vida, which means pure life. Uh -huh. And it doesn't take long to understand where they got that from when you're there. Um, but there was a lot of stories to be told there as well. Uh, a lot of really cool animal experiences that I, I'm working on as well. So. That'll now, are become, you gonna, you're going to be doing a photo workshop there? Yeah, in uh, November of 2019. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So and, what I'll kind of do is I'll use uh, my footage and stuff that I have now as a vehicle to bring people to that moment. And then they'll say, hey, yeah, I, I really like that. Can I go with you? Yeah. So, yeah. And so how the, long is, do you have the, you don't know yet? You don't have the plans? Or is oh, it yeah. Like seven days? or uh, Eight days. Eight two, days. Two travel, six, 12-hour days out shooting all day okay yeah, so it's a, it's a little tough but nothing that nobody can't handle it's, it's not difficult just lots of lots of photo opportunities yeah so you have all these crazy birds there's over 400 species of birds Wow. Um, about 15 of them are endemic so that you can only find them there nowhere else in the world wow and the birds there are like they look like they came out of a dr seuss book they're just the most vibrant crazy colors you'll ever see um, I'll give you, for instance, we went down to a beach, uh, and the beach is beautiful. Um, the palm trees kind of go out uh, horizontal instead of up, okay. so they kind of stretch out to the horizon. So I was having lunch on this beach, and then about 12 scarlet macaws flew in and landed right above me, and they were eating sea almonds, so I, I photographed them for a while. Um, so you have those opportunities for these exotic birds. Toucans. Have you ever seen a toucan? 
Have well, you ever I seen have been coached. Co co oh, so, have I you ever seen, seen them eat? Mm -hmm. uh, this was my I first experience. I saw eat. They eat papayas. Wow, they, papayas are in season around here right they now. They pull <laughs> off the yeah, they pull off the papaya and, and use that big beak and scrape it out and throw the the papaya fruit up in the air and eat it. It, it blew my mind. I had no idea they did that. So that, that was a fascinating thing. And the um, sloths, I saw sloths. Yeah. And lots of monkeys. Yeah, four species of monkeys. <laughs> yeah. We saw all four. The howler monkeys, which will wake you up. Sounds like a horror movie. Um, squirrel monkeys, spider monkeys, and then the white-faced monkeys. And the white-faced monkeys are a little ornery. They don't, they don't like humans as much. So oh. they, they like to show you their fangs and shake trees at you. Oh, geez. Yeah, it's really interesting Are they stuff. dangerous? Um, I was told no. <laughs> but I they're scary. <laughs> they're, 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 I can see where you would be intimidated by them, and they'll do their best to intimidate you. Um, they, they, they told me all these things, my guides, um, and when I saw them, I, I found a mom and a baby, and they were just as nice as can be. And mom fell asleep, and I got pictures of the little baby doing little baby monkey things. It was Aww. really, really cool. Yeah. Aww, that's so Very challenging sweet. shooting, though. Much different than here because you're in the canopy of, it's of dark, rainforest. Right? Yeah, so it's dark. Yeah, here we have all this light. Yeah, here we're really blessed. There you're really light constricted. So you really so have to change you, everything that you know. So what do you suggest? Like high ISOs? Is I, I don't like high ISOs. No. I, so depending on movement, you know, uh, shooting wide open if you can. Um, and by and that you mean large aperture like 2.8 if you could if go you that wide? If you have, wide. yeah. Or, uh, F4 if you have one of the bigger lenses. Okay. And then as slow a shutter speed as possible. Which yeah. is scary. That's the hard part. Yeah, it is. Because you might get blurry pictures, especially if, if you have a if long If there's lens. a lot of movement, yeah, yeah. And you don't generally use a tripod. No. I, I have 90% of the time I'll handhold. Wow. Yeah. I, big, I have, that big 200 to 500 lens. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I also have a, the, the bigger 500 prime, which is like 12 wow. pounds. And I have friends I go out with shooting on a regular basis, and they poke fun at me because I'll put my gear on a tripod and when we get where we are I tear it off and I'm running around like a maniac and they say why did you bring your tripod so to carry all my stuff so, so you can rest it when you're yeah, not, yeah, <laughs> when you're exactly, not shooting yeah. <laughs> yeah. wow so yeah it, it was a fun place though um, I, w I was talking earlier about you know you go to these places in search of wildlife but in the end it's always at, at least in my experience it's always been people that have been the most fascinating. So the people there are, are very, very much into conservation um, to the point to where they don't like to wear shoes because they feel disconnected with the earth if their feet aren't touching the ground. And I found wow. that extremely fascinating. And I wish there was more people like that in the States, but there's not. Well, when I was in Costa Rica, there was a black sand beach. You better have some shoes on, man. Oh, it was it lava? So was it, it was like so lava hot, you oh, wouldn't believe oh, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was black sand. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was from lava, but it was hot. Yeah, lava rock stuff. You can't put yeah. your feet on that. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, these, are, these are the guys that are like up in, the, up rainforest. in the rainforest. Yeah, rainforest, living yeah. in the canopy. Yeah. Wow. Really cool people. That's fascinating. Yeah, good stuff. That's so cool. And you had never been there, so did you go with someone or your wife? No, or I, you just I, went all by yourself? Yeah, I'm on You got a guide, though. You yes, had your, yes. A guide or several guides in several different guides. areas? Several guides. Yeah. Several guys that work with a resort um, that took really good care of me. They, oh. they, they kind of take you around, show you what there is to see, and, and you learn a lot. And you, gotta, you don't have to speak Spanish, but it helps. I don't. So I was constantly asking. I thought you were from Florida. I am. I am. <laughs> um, but I, I, I never learned Spanish, unfortunately. I'd like to, but if There's I have still time. time. You're, yeah, you're yeah. a young guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to turn off all English programming and just listen to Spanish. I'll eventually get it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Although taking classes helps. Yeah, yeah. I, what a, one of my guides there was funny. They, they said, you know, tell him how you learned to speak English. So I said, well, how did you learn? He said, from video games. I learned all you hear from me playing video games all the time with American people. I was like, wow. Oh, my God. That's fascinating. So, that is interesting. I never heard that before. Yeah, one good thing for video games, though. So. <laughs> I never, I, I guess I never, I've never been into the video games, but I remember when my son was little, and he's 30, 32, he was six years old, I got him a Nintendo, and my sweet, <laughs> sweet, sweet little boy turned into a little monster. <laughs> I mean, he was so addicted to it. Yeah, yeah. I got rid of that thing. Thank <laughs> God I wasn't raising a kid now when, you know, you couldn't keep him away now. Yeah, but right, right. Back then, I couldn't believe it. Oh, anyway. All right, so what, give us, um... Let's see how, let's see you think on your feet. Five good tips for either storytelling or adding mood to your images. 
Ooh. Five, just five. Just five. Well, I gotta hide some of them close to me. You know, I, I can't give away all of them. Give tips. away your <laughs> secrets, come on. Uh, there are no secrets anymore. This, this is true. Um, I'd say the biggest one, I don't know if I could do five, the biggest one that would fall for both would be just being in the right place at the right time. And what, how do you do that? Um, again, I, I get lucky. So. You just gotta get out there. <laughs> yeah. You gotta be I, out there all the yeah, time. You, it's you, part of it. We, we, you asked earlier about like, like my day. You know, I'll get up before sunrise and I'll head out and I'll shoot all day. I, I you know, don't come back until sunset sometimes. So spend as much time out there as you can, as you can afford. And, um, spend time with all of whatever it is you're shooting, landscape, you know, uh, and study, study other people, other photographers, other art. That's a, that's a big one for me. The, I think the biggest help was Bob Ross, the, the painter. He, he, you know, being able to see him. That's it. Afro, the, the guy, Afro guy, right? Fantastic. <laughs> being able to see him turn a blank canvas into a painting with so much depth really helped me understand composition because okay. I, I got to see him put it together piece by piece. So. All right. Yeah, big inspiration on that part. But it's a five for emotion. That's two. Yeah, two. Uh, so you got to be out there, number one. Yeah. Number two, study other photographers and sure and, and wildlife, whatever and you're whatever you're targeting. That's that's huge. Um, well, yeah. If you're doing wildlife, you need to know the behavior, right? Yeah, you know, and um, I can give you the greatest tip an older guy ever told me: uh, three things. You find their where they sleep, they won't be far from there. You find their water and you find their food. If you can find those three things within one area, you'll find your subject every time. Okay. And it, it's true, I've, I've done it myself. And if you can do that, you're, you're golden. You, you'll have your animal, whatever it is you're looking for. Okay. Um, lighting. Lighting. Huge, that, that does such a, a big thing um, for, for emotion and mood and, and drama. Um, I'd say that's probably the most important because without it, you don't have a photograph. So, now what do you? Are there certain types of lighting that are better than others? For of course, the uh, golden hour. Uh, depending on where you live on the planet, that that varies. Um, so, right after sunrise or right before sunset, half hour, hour, either way. Okay. Um, I've found that for landscape photography, there's there's more time called the blue hour. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. And go ahead, explain it to our audience so in case they're not. Yeah, maybe a half hour before sunrise or after sunset. Um, you have a lot of amazing light that your camera can pick up, but maybe you don't. Yeah. So you can do some really awesome landscapes with softer light um, during the blue hour. So okay. Lighting definitely. Um, that's four. That's four, four, maybe three, yeah. I don't know. Wait, we said be in the right place. Right place at the right time. Study other. Study others. Uh, what did we say? Now I already forgot. <laughs> lighting. Lighting. I thought um, there was one in between. No. That passion, you really have to be passionate about what you're doing. That, that comes through, I think, more so than anything. So you have to be passionate about what it is you're telling the story about what it is you're, you're documenting or photographing. Um, and that also plays in with emotion because if you're passionate, then you have emotion kind of coming from all of it anyways. So passionate, you have to be really passionate about what it is you're pursuing. Um, and what, if, what, I mean, is there a way to get passionate about something? Oh, uh, good question. I'm just curious because you know, I'm, I've lived in Florida most of my life, and I've lived in Naples for 25, 26 years, but I never went hiking in the Everglades until like three and a half years ago. Right. Because I never had the desire. And oh my God, it only took one time to get me out there deep, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Right. I can't believe how cool this is, and I became a fanatic. So maybe so, just trying new experiences helps you with passion, or maybe just even oh. like, you're making things so interesting with your storytelling, like the fish. Yeah. I mean, I never knew I cared about the mullet fish, <laughs> except to eat them, yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. But you made it so interesting, so maybe even learning, you were saying learning, but learning mm. knowledge can help you with passion too, I would think. Sure. All right, uh, you got one more. Travel. Travel. Oh yeah, travel is probably the most, uh, most important and least talked about thing I think everyone should do um, because again it, it gets you out of this bubble that uh -huh. you're in like you know if you're born and raised in Florida and you spend 
40 years of your life only in Florida, you're witnessing a very, very small amount of our beautiful world, our beautiful people, cultures. It changes from state to state, Boy, from that, country to country. Just within Florida, it within changes Within Florida, a lot. <laughs> correct. And being able to travel and experience all of that will really open your mind to a lot of different things. Um, probably really good for all types of photography because uh, you could do really good street photography you know, learning the lives of people and, and the things they do with the different cultures, the different foods, everything. And it's different, like you said, everywhere you go. Um, and with all of that, the environment changes outside, your lighting changes, you have new challenges, the wildlife changes from place to place. So, I mean, you can be in a foreign place with foreign people, foreign foods, foreign animals. It's an amazing experience. It's like being a kid all over again because everything is fresh and new. So that's very, Great for me. That's very helpful to I like it. to get the passion going. So good advice. So all right. So what's your next adventure? We're wrapping uh, up. Um, just staying local for right now. Okay. Yeah, working with the Osprey and finishing that up. So then, when uh, when what's your deadline? Do you have a deadline for the YouTube video? No, probably. Come on, we want a deadline. Probably three or four <laughs> days. Three oh, or four that days. quick? Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've got. All the content now, I've just kind of... You just have to edit it? To put it together and, and tell All the right, story. All right, well, no pressure, but our entire audience <laughs> is going to go to your YouTube. You have to get the show notes up quickly, Heather. <laughs> we'll put the YouTube link in the show notes. Mm. And by the time they're up... They can go watch the Maybe Ospreys. they can watch the Osprey story. Yeah, cool. <laughs> awesome. What's your website? Um, msmithphotos.com. M, like Mark. Yes. msmithphotos.com. Dot com. Yeah. That'll send you everywhere. That'll send you to YouTube. That'll send you to Instagram, Facebook, everything else. Yeah, send you to the workshops, the books. That's like the hub. What if so. I want to find the metal detector book? That you just go to Amazon and search for metal detecting. It's, the, it's it, the number one seller, so Amazon will tell you which one it is. That's so cool. They don't mind. <laughs> they don't mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> and remember to like and comment on our podcast. We really would appreciate reviews on iTunes. It helps us so much. It helps us come up in the search engines. The more reviews that we have, especially if they're good, <laughs> um, and Facebook and YouTube as well. All the comments help us a lot. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. Join us next week for 100, episode 117 with sports and photojournalist Amanda Inscore. Get up!